Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to WorkCover Queensland's Common Law webinar on the topic of social events and employer liability. Uh, my name is Tim Lose. I'm a senior lawyer at WorkCover Queensland. I'll be your host today. And joining me today at WorkCover Central um, are our two presenters, Kim Kavanagh and Jim Tilby from Ede, Byrne and Hall. And behind me is Elise from our comms team, and she's running the, uh, the presentation through Teams today. So thank you, Elise. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Yogara and Turrbal peoples as the traditional custodians of the land in which we work and from which we are speaking today. We thank them and their elders past and present for their ongoing connection to land, waters, culture and community. Uh, some housekeeping. We record these sessions and later on we're going to send out the link uh, to the recording along with the slide pack. Um, and we also send out a short survey to uh, gather some feedback about the session. Um, so we appreciate if you take the time to do that. Um, the recorded session also gets uploaded to our WorkCover YouTube channel um, and we'll be um, advertising that via social media. Um, please feel free to submit questions during the webinar. There's a Q&A button, I'm told, at the top of the toolbar uh, on your screen. Uh, we do our best to answer the questions at the end. Um, we've got some questions that were already submitted at, at the time of registration, so we'll be tackling those first and then we'll get to the ones that pop up um, over the course of the webinar. Um, just note we can't answer any uh, policy or claim specific questions uh, and we encourage you to contact your relationship manager if you've got one uh, or to reach out to a customer advisor handling a claim of yours um, for your business if you need more information about a specific claim. Uh, and finally, if you have any technical issues, please refer to the help information under the more button, uh, which is again in the toolbar at the top of your screen. All right, to introduce today's presenters, uh, first we have Kim Kavanagh, who is a director at Heed Burnham Hall. Kim has extensive, per sorry, extensive experience in personal injury law and property law and has a particular interest in dispute resolution. Uh, she has experience acting for both insurers and injured parties and acts for corporate clients and individuals in Toowoomba, Warwick and Roma. Welcome, Kim. Uh, we also have Jim Tilby, Special Counsel at Heed Burn and Hall. He now works exclusively in the personal injury team at Heed Burn and Hall in matters relating to public liability, compulsory third party claims and personal injury compensation claims in which he acts for the defendant insurer. Welcome, Jim. Uh, we'll just do a brief look at the agenda for today. So Jim's up first. So in part one, Jim will be looking at work events and statutory considerations. And in part two, Kim will have a look at case law surrounding uh, work social events and will analyse if injuries occur in the course of employment. Uh, Kim's also going to provide some tips uh, to employers on preventing and minimising injury when planning a work event. Uh, and finally, we'll finish with some questions. Okay, before I hand over to our guests, oh yeah, just a reminder that any information uh, we provide um, today, including in response to questions via the work cover or Hinkburn Hall, that's just to be um, taken as general information only and not legal advice. And that's all from me. So I'll pass over now to Jim to start. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, I suppose by way of introduction, um, we've kept the more interesting part of the session to seconds so that people stay online longer. <laughs> Um, so I'll be I'll be doing a bit of a, a background, uh, more uh, raising the issues that can um, can be significant uh, when uh, I suppose dealing with the, the kind of specific functions that we're uh, you're probably logged on to hear about in the first place. So um, if you're listening to a recording of this, you can probably shut down your laptop or fast forward for about ten or fifteen minutes to the interesting bit when Kim actually talks about social functions. So. Let's get started. Uh, the agenda, are you at work uh, or not? Uh, that's become blurry in recent times. What other complicating factors can occur? Um, case summaries for work events where employment is or is not a significant contributing factor is the more interesting part of the topic, which we will get to shortly. OK, back to basics. What is an injury for the purposes of the Workers' Compensation and Rehabilitation Act? An injury is a personal injury arising out of or in the course of employment if the employment is a significant contributing factor. Now, arising out of or in the course of um, means what they say it means. Um, the interesting part of that is significant contributing factor. Um, it, uh, sorry, I should also say mental injuries, psychological injuries can be excluded if attributable to reasonable management action taken in a reasonable way. Reasonable management action is a huge topic and I'm not going to be delving into that one in any significant way today. Significant contributing factor is also a huge topic, but I'm going to uh, scrape through it really quickly. 
Um, it was added in 1994. It was an attempt to exclude injuries where the relationship of the injury to employment was only minimal and for which employers were held responsible. Um, and that's taken from the explanatory memorandum. Classic case, Goodman, Fielder and Workcover. Um, if you read the first few lines, um, the degenerative spinal disease had reached the point at which uh, it might be exacerbated and rendered symptomatic by stretching to get something out of a pantry, bending over to tie shoelaces or turning over in bed. Um, a classic statement in respect of the law. In that particular case, uh, President Hall found that because uh, the time of the incident and the onset of pain um, had some proximity to employment, it found that employment was a significant contributing factor. I would like to think that uh, today a different decision might have been reached, but um, that's the law as it was um, 20 years ago, which is not too long ago. Another example, um, Mr Newbury was a delivery driver and uh, sustained injuries in a motor vehicle accident. In that particular case, uh, Justice Dutney um, found that, yes, the, it was the requirements of his employment that put him on the road. And for that reason, work was a significant contributing factor. Now, uh, this is where we get to uh, some situations that might be more relevant later when we're talking about social functionings. Uh, when is an injury taken to arise out of employment? Um, I didn't put in all the sections because they're a little bit wordy, but sections 34, 35 and 36. Um, when it arises out of employment, funnily enough, um, when you're temporarily absent during an ordinary recess, provided the worker was not voluntarily subjecting themselves to an abnormal risk of injury. During a recess or on a journey between home and place of employment. So for B, C and D, employment doesn't need to be a significant contributing factor. For D, it is not taken to be a journey if there is a significant interruption or a substantial delay before starting the journey or substantial interruption or deviation from the journey. So I've got some cases there. I don't have the citations with them. When we get the slides sent out to you, I'll make sure that the citations are there. You won't be able to find so them, which is probably the most interesting out of the five, in my opinion. So I might just um, add that as a, uh, an accessory after the fact. And um, so you get a chance to read of it because it's probably the only decision there that I don't agree with. Um, but in Soden, <laughs> I'll tell you why in a minute too, if I, if I get going. 31 minutes uh, in a hotel, not a substantial interruption in the context of a journey of 76 minutes. I say it's probably wrong for different reasons. Um, the reason I say it's probably wrong, um, in those 30, 31 minutes, it was the evidence of the... Um, injured person that they had four mid-strength uh, beers, uh, pots. If you have four of those in 31 minutes, chances are under normal circumstances, you would be well over the limit. The sections of the Act that I didn't show you, Section 36, Subsection 2, has a specific provision which refers to Section 328A of the Criminal Act. I can't remember the Criminal exact Code. Name. Criminal Code, oh. which includes a reference to uh, driving while intoxicated um, it was a single vehicle accident. Uh, the claimant was taken to hospital for a blood alcohol reading. At the, after the incident, he uh, watched some of the blood off his face with a hot stubby that was in his car and then drank after it. So when I say it's probably wrong for different reasons, the timing, yeah, probably wasn't a substantial interruption or deviation, but the claim probably should have been excluded for intoxication. Um, Workers' Compensation Regulator V. McCool, uh, that had to go to appeal, uh, but on appeal it was found a delay of five to six hours in a two and a half hour journey was significant. Now, the reason that seems to have caught out uh, the commissioner who heard it at first instance was that um, there was no reason uh, understood for why there was such a delay in circumstances where the person was known to have a significant illness. Um, so that he sort of got stuck on that a little bit. And, uh, but eventually it was fixed on appeal, a delay is a delay is a delay, uh, and five to, eight hour, five to six hours in a two-and-a-half-hour journey is what you would think would be a delay. Sukrajan and Simon Blackwood, conversation of 13 minutes and 42 seconds in a car park, uh, not a substantial interruption. Yeah, I, I, that's probably right. 
don't disagree with that. Greer and Simon Blackwood, uh, diversion of 10 minutes in a 20-minute journey, not substantial. Uh, interesting, Greer has a uh, quote from the explanatory memoranda that says that um, part of the reason for these provisions to be introduced was to take into account modern life. And the examples were given of uh, parents collecting children from school, uh, which is a, a brief interruption in their day. Um, funnily enough, all the cases deal with people going to the pub and then uh, attempting to drive. So um, who'd have thunk? Masters and workers' compensation is a good example of that. Uh, claimant finished work at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., went to the dry top, dried off where he was going to pick up his cousin. Instead, he had some drinks and then he um, sustained significant injuries at 11.30 when he fell from the vessel onto the dry dock. Um, there was a substantial delay, so not a journey claim. When does the journey start or end? Um, again, this has also become blurry in the context of modern life. The journey from or to home starts at the boundary of the land on which the home is situated. So that's relatively clear. When does the journey from or to work start? It's not so clear. Uh, decision of T's and Polychronus was a statutory decision at first instance. Um, most of the decisions I talk about are statutory claims uh, rather than common law claims. And the reason is that what I'm talking about here is mostly entitlement to pursue uh, a statutory claim or a claim for compensation for damages. In any event, the claimant was um, sexually assaulted by a co-worker. She'd arrived in the car park, uh, ready to go in and commence her work as a packer at a networks. She was sexually assaulted by a co-worker. And um, in that particular case, the uh, commissioner followed earlier decisions of Clement and Bacco. That was a motor vehicle accident at the ancient coal mine. Uh, it was found that the incident still happened on the employer's property. The claimant was a drag line operator. The place of employment was the drag line. So a journey claim was accepted and employment did not need to be a significant contributing factor. Uh, workers' compensation in Dreden, Dreden, uh, meat worker at AMH was, as Australian meat holding, sorry, was assaulted by someone with a baseball bat. Once again, in a car park, good idea to stick cameras up in car parks. And test it. Um, as he arrived at his vehicle after ceasing work, he was employed as a knife hand, so he had left his place of employment when heading to his car after his shift was complete. The journey claim was accepted, and one that didn't, did not need to be a significant contributing factor. Uh, I suppose just while, to finish off the, the round on Polychronus, um, the claimant in Polychronus had her journey claim accepted but she was unsuccessful in her common law claim in 2016 uh, because she failed to establish negligence on the part of the employer as far as the sexual assault was concerned, in essence failing to establish that the employer was aware of the risk of assault and should have taken some precautions to address that risk. So a couple of cases that deal with when you are at work and when you are not. Um, the first two, both mentioned Qantas and Farming Life, deal with long-haul flight attendants. In the Blanche case, um, she sustained injuries. She was going for a walk to get lunch, staying at a hotel in the US. Her cyclist collided with her held but for her employment. She would not have been in Los Angeles. Uh, employment was found to be a significant contributing factor. In uh, Kennelly, the uh, long haul flight attendant sustained injuries when involved in an accident on a motorcycle on his way to the airport. He was required. Uh, to attend the US consulate in Sydney to maintain a current US visa. All the injuries were suffered in the course of his employment and his employment was a significant contributing factor to his injuries. Patsy Manolos, which Kim will mention as well, claimed worked in a remote area of WA, injured in the course of a sightseeing journey on his day off. Held that the injury was sustained during an interval occurring within an overall episode of work and while engaged with his employer's encouragement, in an activity which his employer had organised. Comcare and PVYW. Claimant injured while engaged in sexual intercourse while on a work trip when the light fitting she was held on, holding on to broke. Held in the circumstances in which an employee is injured must be connected to the inducement or encouragement of the employer. An inducement or encouragement to be at a particular place does not provide the necessary connection to employment merely because an employee is employee, sorry, is injured whilst engaged in an activity at that place. And Oaks Hotel and Simon Blackwood. 
Claimant was employed by Oaks Hotel, was offered free accommodation. She was sexually assaulted whilst at that accommodation. Held that there was a sufficient connection between the employment and the injury sustained in the assault for employment to be a significant contributing factor. So a variety of decisions, a variety of outcomes, probably not a lot of clear guidance given uh, when you throw all those together. Um, worth mentioning in this context, what is the impact of working from home? There is a very good uh, research paper written by the Productivity Commission in 2021 um, read it recently, it still remains relevant. It'd be interesting to see what they say two years later now that there's a, uh, now that COVID is um, not a feature so much in terms of uh, shutdowns, lockdowns, whatever you call them. Um, but what they said was in blurring the lines between the home and the workplace, working from home also blurs what is within and beyond the scope of employers' responsibilities to eliminate and mitigate workplace risks. What that report did say, however, uh, key risks of working from home were referred to as including musculoskeletal damage, often in someone's neck and back, arising from inappropriate or non-ergonomic workstation furniture, or sometimes being more sedentary, sitting down for and for longer periods of time. <coughs> Some of us have put on weight, <coughs> just quietly, um, than when in a centralised workplace. Uh, mental ill health arising from social isolation, due to decreased face-to-face -face contact with co-workers and or blurred lines between work and leisure, which can be associated with a tendency to work longer hours, experience stress, suffer burnout. If you take five minutes out or half an hour or an hour out of your day to do something for your kids or drive people somewhere or pick somebody up or dogs are barking, you then try and recover that time on the weekend or at night or it's now very difficult to pin people down in respect of when work starts and when work finishes and I think many people, uh, at least my perception is that many people now doing desk jobs from home would say that it starts when I turn the computer on whenever that is and finishes when I turn the computer off. Now, I saw an article the other day where employers apparently can now, uh, there is uh, software which will determine when keystrokes are happening <laughs> on people's home computers, which is um, astonishing and disturbing all at once. Um, yeah, anyway. So that kind of thing can, can add to stress and, and uh, yeah, things that perhaps employers might want to take into account in determining uh, how they manage to their work from home people. Um, although it would <coughs> seem significantly less likely to include hazardous manual tasks, which are the bane of my existence, as referred to in the Code of Practice 2021, uh, such as repetitive or sustained force, high or sudden force, repetitive movement, sustained or awkward posture, Exposure to vibration, which is the, the classics from which so many claims are made. Excellent timing, Good Jim. Good job. Thank you. Um, so we're really going to move into this next phase of looking specifically at uh, consideration of when injuries occur in the course of employment in the classic Christmas party function or similar um, functions and uh, I don't know if this is a feature of being a lawyer, but certainly in looking at this topic, I have become the fun police, um, as has Jim. So it could just be us. Uh, best we don't look too deep into that, it's I think. Me. It's not me. <laughs> the appropriate title, I think, ought to be how to take the fun out of workplace function. Uh, and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at these three yeah. aspects. Hopefully we'll be able to figure it out after looking at these um, the first one is, when will an injury sustained at a workplace function be compensable? Um, as identified by Jim, an injury falls within the scheme when an injury arises out of or in the course of employment, if employment is a significant contributing factor. Uh, the scheme's not fault-based. So what I'm talking about here is not liability um, for damages. Um, so I'm not looking at negligence claims. I'm looking at whether these claims ought to be accepted um, as a workplace injury um, for an entitlement to compensation, weekly benefits, medical expenses, etc. So when we take a look at this, we're really looking closely at that phrase in the course of employment, which is really broad. Have a look at that. Secondly, we'll consider the question of whether a workplace function or when it ceases to be a workplace function. Um, you know, workplace events might start at one location and then carry on throughout the night. Um, when does it stop being a workplace function? Uh, and then finally, hopefully, we might be able to identify a couple of things that you can think about as employers when planning workplace functions. 
Um, certainly I've got some tips, but as I said, it will just take the fun out of it. So be warned. So the first place we'll have a look at is Walnar and Travelodge. Um, the worker here was employed as a housemaid at the motel. Christmas party occurred outside of working hours. The claimant left work to get ready, came back with her partner. Uh, the worker was invited to attend the Christmas party. It was not compulsory. It was a staff Christmas party. So what occurred is she suffered an injury when she stumbled and fell on the edge of the dance floor. Um, the party was um, held on the lawns of the motel where the barbecue had been commenced. So the question is, was the injury uh, found to be connected with employment? And the answer is yes. Um, the question is why? So this case is applying um, the precedent um, test, which was at that time, well, the question to be asked at that time was whether an injury occurs in the course of employment depends upon whether the worker was doing something they were reasonably required, expected or authorised to do in order to carry out their duties. Um, the Court of Appeal found that the purpose of the event was to foster good relations between management and staff as a whole and relations between staff. The social purpose was centred around the employer-employee relationship and it did not matter that attendance was voluntary. So, yes, the court found that participation was authorised by the employer and therefore occurred in the course of employment and that injured worker was entitled to compensation under the relevant scheme. The next case we've got is um, Crowley and Piber Mining. So the facts here were... Um, uh, not a Christmas party, but a comparable event. It was a charity rugby match. Um, the facts that distinguish this case are that the rugby match was organised by the workers, not the employer. The employer didn't actively encourage participation in the event, but it did circulate reminders of the event to raise money for charity. The worker was not rostered on to work the day of the rugby match, um, and it was not an exercise designed to promote relations between workers or otherwise. The employer didn't pay wages, didn't make any donations, didn't supply equipment or drinks. Um, no one had asked for permission to participate. So the question is, of course, was it, did it occur in the course of employment? And the answer is no. Uh, the circulation of that uh, material was asserted by the worker in that case to be uh, conduct uh, by silence, that it was an authorised event or an event that was encouraged but ultimately the court said that you cannot authorise or encourage by silence. So that was the conclusion that they came to. The, um, the other thing here was that there's another workplace involved. So it was um, sort of a, a mining-related setup where there was a host employer and that host employer's workers were um, significantly involved in organising this match too, which I think had a significant contribution towards the outcome. So in the course of employment, look, these cases really go through um, applying that and looking at those different features, Clancy and Department of Health and also Van Heften, um, each of those was a social football game in which, uh, as opposed to Pybar, the employer actively encouraged and authorised participation by workers. Um, it didn't matter that the workers were off duty or that the event was voluntary. In each case, um, it was found to have occurred in the course of employment. So that's really sort of applying just a slight difference in those facts, which comes to a different conclusion. In the case of Wyatt, um, the employer didn't create those circumstances, but it encouraged the employer to take part in the police games. And the court thought that the employer really benefited from the participation by the worker in that it made them look better. It made them look like a caring employer. So that really contributed to, I think, court's decision in that regard. It derived a benefit. It reorganised, the employer reorganised the um, the workers' days so that they wouldn't miss out on pay um, and encourage them to um, undertake any activity and the injury that arose was therefore taken to have occurred in the course of employment. The case of Hatsuman Hatsumanos? Hatsumanos? Potato, potato. Uh, it was a unanimous decision in the High Court. Um, the worker, as Jim pointed out, was actually invited by the employer to take part in a sightseeing tour of Outback Western Australia. It occurred between two shifts. The worker was living at a um, work site um, camp because it was in Outback Western Australia. Um, the employer organised food, it organised the cars and it encouraged a number of other employees to attend. So the court said that, look, in that case, because the worker has been encouraged to attend, it has actually 
um, organise things. It's been really quite involved in organising that for its employees. Then, yes, it's been taken um, to have occurred in the course of employment. I said, look, where the employer has expressly or impliedly induced or encouraged the employee to spend the interval or interlude uh, at a particular place or in a particular way, it will fall within um, the scope of that in the course of employment question. Um, the next case we've got to have a look at is a matter of Cooper and QComp. Um, so here, Ms Cooper's participation was not merely authorised or expected, was actually actively pursued by the employer. So the employer used its monthly meetings with employees and a communication book used for communication between shifts to seek volunteers for their Christmas Day celebrations for residents. Um, Cooper answered the call and spent the day preparing, assisting and packing up. Um, no doubt the employer received a benefit from the activity. It strengthened relationships between it, the residents and their families. Um, there was no expectation of remuneration and she was not paid. She was working alongside church volunteers who were not employees. And the employer tried to argue in this case that, or keep on did, that the um, worker was not a worker for that exercise, but participated as a in a volunteer capacity. Um, and therefore the injury occurred outside of the contract of service and did not arise in the course of employment, um, but that argument was not accepted. Um, ultimately, it didn't matter who she was working with at the time, there was a contract of employment um, and she was clearly doing something for the benefit of the employer and that was actively encouraged uh, to do so and was therefore entitled to compensation. So I think that's pretty clear as a starting place. Let's now have a look at what happens when the party continues on beyond that organised formal event that kicks off Christmas celebrations? Um, Hattenfels. In this case, we've got the facts set out here. So um, Christmas party function starts at the pub. Meals and alcohol are provided. The pub closes. The group of employees decide with one of the managing director, so um, office manager of the employer, to take it back to the um, employer's premises, um, sorry, the uh, personal homes. So the managing director and office manager are um, the directors of the employer, it goes back to their place. More drinks are provided by um, the managing director and the office manager. Nobody is asked to leave. They own a golf cart. Uh, a group of three actually got permission from the office manager, um, so the wife, the director, to take the golf cart because somebody had not seen kangaroos before and they thought they'd go find some kangaroos. Um, the golf cart was driven. The injured worker and another employee jumped on the back of the golf cart at some point during the tour. And when they got back to the premises, they realised the injured worker was no longer there. They found him um, had fallen off the golf uh, cart at some point in time, not sure how, um, with an injury. So in this case, Insure argued that not all of the employees have continued on with the party. Some went home. There was no express invitation to continue the celebrations at the employer's house, despite it being permitted. Um, the specific activity that caused the injury uh, was argued to be uh, the climbing on the back of the golf cart and it was asserted that that was done without permission and was clearly dangerous. It was gross misconduct which took it outside the course of employment. It argued that the specific act of riding a golf cart was not expressly or impliedly induced or encouraged by the employer. Um, the argument on behalf of the injured worker was that there was a, continu uh, a continuation of the festive activity and participation by employees of the employer. The social activity was attended almost exclusively by employees. There was no neighbours or anybody else taking part. There was no significant interruption or interference with the nature of the social event just because it was a new venue. And therefore, the activity was encouraged, authorised and induced by the employer. Um, there was no clear evidence that the claimant was instructed not to get on the golf cart. And there were certainly no assertions that the golf cart was being driven in any negligent fashion that was being slowly driven. There was really no understanding of how the worker fell off the golf cart. And here we can see that the decision was that the injury occurred in the course of employment. Um, the continuation of those social activities in the employer's premise, premises was seamless. There was really no interruption or deviation from the intended beneficial purpose of the employer allowing a Christmas party celebration 
uh, to facilitate a harmonious working group and was therefore taken to be an authorised activity. So uh, due to the serious nature of the injury, um, there is a defence that's available to an insurer that where the injury arises solely from the serious and willful misconduct of a worker, um, it would fall outside of that description, but um, it only applies where there's not a serious injury. Uh, it didn't apply here. And it probably wouldn't have succeeded in any event given the factual findings in that case. Um, but I think it could have gone either way. And it really comes down to the specific facts um, that are accepted by a court, which can be demonstrated by the next case of Collins. Um, on the face of it, it seems like a similar situation. So Collins um, was an employee manager, sole director of the employer, staff, started the Christmas party, uh, lunch at a restaurant, cost was met by the employer, uh, drinks were provided and paid for. At the end of the lunch, Colin said, let's go to my place. It's um, terrible weather outside. All but two to three employees did that. Um, there was no formal arrangements of how that was going to occur. So somewhat of a distinction to the last case, um, everybody made their own way at their own time, at their own leisure. Some people bought their own drinks. There was no real agreement as to how that was going to occur. Um, Collins didn't provide the drinks, didn't fund any part of that. Um, and Collins continued to consume alcohol, um, cocaine and probably other things at that um, lunch and then did so at his home as well. And Collins suffered the injury when he fell from his balcony to the ground. There was some factual dispute as to how the fall actually occurred, but that's no doubt how he was injured. So in this case, the court decided the opposite. The injury did not arise in the course of employment. Um, the mere fact that Mr Collins, a respondent's manager, participated in the activity did not mean that the respondent, being the employer, provided the necessary inducement or encouragement to make the gathering at his home a continuation of the work function. So here there was a really uh, an attempt by the court to do, disentangle Collins as a person and an employee from the employer, um, and the court managed to do so, finding that it was not the employer that encouraged this activity. Um, the principle that was explained in Hatsum Analysts directs attention to the circumstances in which the injury um, was suffered for the purposes of determining whether those circumstances rendered the injury as referable to place or an activity. So if the injury occurs as a result of an activity, um, the question is whether the employer induced or encouraged the employee to engage in that activity. So here, um, the question was not whether the consumption of alcohol and cocaine caused the activity, but whether the employer induced or encouraged the employee to engage in that activity in which he was engaged at the time of his injury. So looking at what he was doing, which was attempting to fling himself over the balcony to land on a concrete ledge behind that, was an activity that was not one um, where the employer induced or encouraged that employee to engage in that activity. So I think that um, the takeaway is just from those two cases is that it really comes down to the specific facts on each case. Um, the result will always turn on what facts the court finds um, and irrespective of whether an injury does occur in the course of employment or not, the consequences of the injuries are quite severe um, or can be quite severe and life-changing. So three more cases um, where injuries are found not to have occurred in the course of employment, all involving social club activities. Um, Campbell, a fatality, the claimant dove into shallow waters. Um, it was a social club arranged Christmas party at Hastings Noosa, all but two employees attended with their family. The employer actually encouraged staff to attend. Um, it was a barbecue. There was no reference to any water activities. The deputy president who um, decided this case decided that or found that there was no evidence that anybody who was in a managerial position while at work did or said anything that would have encouraged staff to swim in the river, let alone dive into it. Um, and it was not appropriate to simply describe the activity as a Christmas party and therefore find that any injury which occurred was compensable. So, um, hats and manos, potato, potato. Um, comes into it again. First, what is the activity that's being engaged in at the time? And secondly, did the employer induce or encourage the employee to engage in that activity was the question for Campbell. 
um, for Hadla, Hadla, the Work Social Club used the employer's email and logo, but otherwise it was considered to be quite separate. The employer did not encourage participation in a cruise, had no part in funding the activity. Um, the worker fell off uh, the cruise vessel in the course of that activity. The court found that it did not occur in the course of employment. Um, in Eagle, uh, claimant bus driver for the local council, president of the Work Social Club, which was also an incorporated association, um, between shifts went shopping for a card for the social club and to also to buy his lunch, he tripped and fell on an escalator. The commission did not accept that the claimant was injured doing something the employer encouraged or induced him to do and found that he was off on a frolic of his own. Um, one of our favourite sayings. Frolic? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, when he decided to go shopping. So to sum up, um, again, it's really just dependent on the facts of each individual case. It does not necessarily matter whether attendance is voluntary, unpaid, or occurs outside of office hours. If the employer encourages, induces, expects, or authorises participation in a particular activity, an injury arising from that, from that activity will more often than not be taken to have occurred in the course of employment. So, recommendations? Look, it's easy to say these things. Um, undertake an assessment of the risk of the activity. Take reasonable precautions to minimise that risk of injury. If you don't take the time to actually think about what you're planning, then you've not then given consideration to what the risks are. So you actually have to take that step to actually think about well, what are we going to do and is that actually a good idea? I mean, I think that's as simple as it gets. And then if you are undertaking an activity, think about what precautions you as an employer need to take to try to minimise the risk of injury. Look, this is just things that I've really come up with um, and coming from the cases, you know, when will the event start and stop? I think it can be really helpful for employers if you've got a luncheon or a dinner organised, you can say, this is what we're providing. You, anything after that is, is on you or, you know, we're not providing anything after that. Don't fund anything after that. Um, don't encourage activities after that if you do not intend them to be part of the employment activity. Um, so planned party games, physical activities, obviously that does increase the risk of injury. And, you know, is it appropriate for the type of workers that you've got? Um, if you are doing it in your workspace, is it appropriate with what you're doing? Um, don't forget about manual handling risks, trip hazards, creation of hazards through activities, office decorating is one that pops up, um, you know, trips and falls, um, setting up the event, cleaning up for events, um, social clubs, are they activities of the employer or not? Do you encourage them? Employers often get a benefit from social clubs. Um, does that mean that all the activities will fall within the scope um, of that question of in the course of activity, sorry, in the course of employment? Um, supply of alcohol. Uh, if you are doing the supply of alcohol yourself, um, you know, that can really be a question mark of whether that can be done safely without a responsible service of alcohol um, restrictions in place. Um, my recommendations are... Don't mix alcohol with water or golf carts. Formalise when the work activity starts and stops. Um, reconsider submitting your desk jockey employees to contact physical sports, probably not a good idea, and skip the slip and slide. It it's, um, probably has no place for uh, Christmas parties, employer-related Christmas parties, I should say. And, look, nobody has fun when someone's seriously injured, so overall we wish you the best of luck with the uh, Christmas period coming up. I think um, you've got some questions, Tim, for us. Yeah, we've got some questions that came in in advance there. Excellent questions. Um, and we'll go through these ones first, and then a few more have come through just while you've been talking, and I'll, if we've got time, I'll ask those as well. And one of them was one that I was going to ask myself, which is terrific, because I get out of putting you on the spot myself. Um, first one up there was how do we ensure, how do you ensure, how do employers ensure that employees get home safely at the end of an event? Yeah, I, look, to some degree that is there is some responsibility for employees um, that you've got to, um, I mean, we're probably dealing mostly with adults but not always. Um, so if you've got younger staff, there really needs to be some consideration had there but also with where you are actually having the um, activity. So if you are having the activity in a remote location where the opportunity um, 
for travel is limited, that would require a lot more consideration than what it would if it was in a CBD Brisbane, for example. I agree entirely. And I think um, in the past I've had this discussion where if you're going to have a, a function at a, at a venue where you expect people to get their own transport home and there will be alcohol involved, and typically there is with these things, um, then it's hard to look past the CBD where people have access to public transport, Ubers, taxis, mm -hmm. uh, train, bus, those kinds of things, because that's really where I suspect you will uh, find that people are less able to look after themselves mm -hmm. and um, require more of a um, uh, assistance. Yeah, and also on the topic of if you are yourself hiring a vehicle to take staff to and from, there has to be some level of care taken to ensure that the person that is doing the driving um, is actually not drinking, you know, um, which I know that seems like a simple concept, but... Uh, we do see the opposite where everybody gets to partake in the activities and then it's, oh, weren't you driving or weren't you driving? You know, it's simple things. It's a good argument for outsourcing, but, again, it's, it's a question of scale and how big is the employment yeah, force that you need absolutely. to cater for. Um, what's, the, what's the capability for people to travel? How far are they travelling? Do, yeah. tra do they work um, locally? Do they work regionally? So, um, there's so there's all sorts two of things. Questions. Consider what you're doing. You know, undertake a risk assessment and then take what precautions you can. Next one. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, where do you draw the line of employer-employer employer responsibility when alcohol is involved? Alcohol is always a big... I, I draw the line when they cut me off. <laughs> responsible which is service pretty soon. of alcohol. Um, it's pretty yeah. quickly. But, but I think that's um, responsible service of alcohol. But in an IT world, where you have to scale these things. Um, obviously, some smaller employees aren't going to have the, the cash or the funds to... Um, necessarily hire people with RSA training to provide the, but that's the idea where, where you simply say that, um, you know, you've had too much cut off because as soon as you raise that question, you create conflict and as soon as you create conflict and people are already drunk or already behaving in a way where they need to be cut off, you might have problems. Um, so um, Alcohol is a problem. Alcohol is a... It increases the difficulties for employers, is the, the honest truth. Yes. That is the truth. Yeah. So you need to take responsibility. You need to actually think about these things. Put in place um, either a commercial operator do it where there is somebody that actually has RSA requirements in place so that they can manage it for you um, and otherwise you are taking on that risk yourself. But, but again, this is why I've raised journey claims all the time because it's the travel more often than not that is, is the issue. You'll have some cases where people just get uh, off their nut and become aggressive um, and those are often different issues, but mm -hmm. yes, um, thinking about those things up front will save a lot of hard work. Drawing the line, it's not possible. Um, it is blurred and it depends on the facts. You can draw a line, but it's not straight. It won't be straight in the case. <laughs> but it is. It's the facts in each case that will determine whether it, it occurs in the course of employment or not. So it's not possible to say right up to this point it's on the employer and right after this point it's the employee. In each case it will be different, unfortunately. I'm not wondering if you planted the question just so you could have the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> question three, is it preferable to provide accommodation for staff at a Christmas function or does that come with additional risks? Well, as I've seen, um, the question as to whether something will fall within the course of employment will consider the place. So if you are encouraged to attend a particular place for an employment activity, whether it be a workplace function or a training function, um, then injuries occurring in that um, place may well be injuries that occur within the course of employment, but regard will be had to the activity that's being undertaken. Comcare um, case is a good example. Just because you are staying in a particular place does not necessarily mean that every injury will be an injury that comes within the course of employment. But the starting place is yes, but what were you doing? And if you were doing something that was not encouraged, induced or authorised by the employer, then the answer might well be no. Um, is it preferable? I think that's just a question as to whether you want staff to attend, how far they have to travel, and whether that's a safer. Yeah, um, it's a scaling issue, I yeah. suspect, for depending on the size of the business. That's and right. The amount of money, the budget for the, uh, the it business. It might well be the well. safer option. Yeah, but no, you would think it's a safer option. Okay. Number four up there, if employees leave work and then return later, does that change liabilities for employers? Well, it depends if we're talking about a recess. Um, so if they are 
in the course of undertaking the usual duties and taking a break, intending to come back. Um, it will depend on what the activity is being done um, during a recess. Um, we have seen some cases where it falls outside of that. Um, uh, our bus driver case that we just spoke about, uh, where there was a four hour break between um, shifts uh, and it did not fall within the course of employment uh, because the activity was not one that was induced or authorised or encouraged by the employer. Um, if we were talking about uh, workers who no longer work for you and then come back and take part in some kind of voluntary activity, I think the question is, is there a contract of employment? And if there's not a contract of employment, well, then they're not likely to be an employee and the question is somewhat yeah. um, you know, a different question. I think um, it's worth noting that the courts are probably unlikely to um, punish someone who was trying to do the right thing as far as their employer is concerned. Mm. And um, a classic uh, recent example of that is Walker and Green Mountain Food Processing, where the maintenance manager finished work at 3.30 p.m., went to the bar, was there for an hour and a half, had on his evidence um, two schooners of mid-strength beer, um, then was driving past the, the work premises on the way home, saw that smoke was coming out of an area that it shouldn't have been, went to investigate, ended up falling through a roof um, five or six metres under concrete, sustained very significant injuries, um, went to a common law claim, Justice Applegarth gave him just under a million dollars clear of the refund. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the what they do when they return later is going to be relevant. Um, why they were returning later is going to be relevant. Um, it's not the fact that they have left work or finished for the day doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the employer's off the hook. Thank you. The, um, the first question we've taken during the course of the chat um, was the one that I was going to talk about, um, and I'll just read it out, but it was, um, what's the liability uh, for injuries that happen on the way to and from work social events? And the reason I was going to ask you this was it came up recently um, that I had to look at a scenario where someone was injured on the way home from an event, um, and I couldn't find very helpful case law on this. And so it was turning on, to my mind, it was turning on, uh, was it a journey claim? Um, and when looking at journey claim, we're looking at whether the employer's got control of the of the venue, I suppose, is does the venue become an extension of the workplace uh, or am I overthinking it? Or do you have, what are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. Um, I think that if the workplace is the location of the function, and the function is something that's actively encouraged, authorised, then I think it would be hard for us to argue against that. I think it would fall within a stereotypical definition of a journey plan. I think it's arising out of or in the course of an employment's not necessarily a contributing factor and doesn't need to be. The two or the from in that in that case, I think, would be a you're relatively not, easy finding. You're not, a, you're not attending it unless you're an employee. No, um, it's not necessarily that you pay during the course of an employment yeah. activity. So I think that if you've got something that can be um, viewed as an employment activity, an activity that is furthering the interests of the employer, something that you've been actively encouraged to do, I would suspect strongly that the travel to and from might well be covered as a journey claim okay. by the Act. Okay. I was probably overthinking or being a bit pedantic in saying that the journey provisions apply to journeys from home to employment. I might be using the wrong words there, but um, and then that's defined as being something that okay. they have control over. So yeah. I was I was mulling over whether an employer can have control over a restaurant if, if they've just booked a table or do they have control over a restaurant if they booked out the entire restaurant? Or is it the activity that's actually the control it's question the rather than the place? It's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. The advantage of a restaurant is, of course, they're all trying to be responsible service for alcohol. So to that extent, then you've outsourced part of, part of the equation. But they're also not doing the cooking. You know, you, they're trained in cooking, so you would hope that there would be no issues in that regard. Uh, we'll do one more question that's come in. Um, we might finish up a little bit early, but that's okay. Um, uh, the question was, is there any liability uh, risk for an employer if employees organise their own private end-of-year event with no management involvement, mm. encouraged and used? Potentially, yes. Good question. Um, yeah, we had a look at that tie bar uh, case involving the rugby league game, which was comparable. It wasn't a Christmas party. Um but it doesn't take much in those circumstances to um, tip it from being outside the course of employment to dipping it into uh, those categories of ones that are activities within the course of employment. The, the pie bar one was one where the employer really took a step back um, and all it really did was say, hey, there's this charity function occurring. 
um, you know, encouraging charitable donations rather than actually encouraging participation in the activity. I think if you had a situation where you know as an employer that employees are organising some kind of Christmas activity um, or party, uh, similar to perhaps a going away lunch that's, you know, you invite maybe five of the employees to, um, if the employer is not actively encouraging participation in that activity, um, then I would think that it would fall outside the scope, or outside the course of employment. Um, however, it wouldn't take much for it to be viewed as something that um, was induced by the employer if the employer participates in circulating invitations or actively encourages involvement, even though they're not organising it, uh, which might tip the other way. I, um, I agree. I think it's a line decision. Yeah. Um, and I, it's a lot more decision. I think the facts will be key. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you, Jim and Kim. Uh, that's all the time we've got for today, everyone. Thank you. Um, if we were unable to get to any of your questions, please reach out to, um, to WorkCover um, uh, for further assistance. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we've recorded this session. It'll be sent out, um, a link will be sent out shortly, and it'll also be uploaded to uh, our YouTube channel where you can also find all our previous webinars in a dedicated playlist. Uh, as I said, we'll also get uh, some feedback in a, in a short survey. So thanks in advance for participating in that. Uh, if you are interested in attending any more of our webinars, keep an eye out for uh, emails, LinkedIn notes, uh, and things on the event page of the WorkSafe Queensland website. I don't think we're going to do another one this year, so probably early next year, we'll, we'll start up again. Um, and that's all. Thank you very much for joining us um, uh, and have a safe and happy Christmas. Thank you.